It's all yours. All right. Thanks a lot. Welcome, everybody. Glad to have you here. Let me see if I can get my uh, PowerPoint up. All right. I think we're good to go. All right. So, so the title of this is Flat Metal Ice uh, Problems and Solutions. Um, well, it's not good to go. Something's wrong there, Dan. It looks good to us. We, I see it. I see the, the first slide. It's not moving. Give me another try, and if you want me to run it, I can run it too. Hold on. I'll try it again. But you may have to run it, so let me. Uh... Okay, one more time. There we go. All right. So um, the reason we put this training together was because we know that. Uh, most all of us, while being uh, ice technicians, are feel, feel very challenged at trying to keep our ice flat and level. It's one of the more challenging things we face on a regular basis. It's a key to having good curling. Um, and many of the things that affect our ice being not flat and level, in some cases, are beyond our control. So the idea behind this training was to be able to hopefully provide some best practice um, information about how people could uh, uh, keep your eyes flat and level. All right, that's not working. So maybe you can run the slides, Dan, I'm thinking, because I can't make this quite work. I sure can. Hold on. I'm just not going forward. Sorry about this technology. It's a bit of a challenge for some of us. I'm getting there, hold on just a sec. Can you see it there? I can. Okay, we're good to go then, I think. That's fine, and I'll just Tell you when to move on. So, all right. So, um, I think it was about two years ago. I was going through an Ontario Curling Association Ice Technics Reference Manual, and you know, I came upon this information uh, in text form about different uh, things you could do to help uh, address problems that were related to flat and level ice. So, in everything that we're going to talk about today, you can find in any of these four sources. I use these sources regularly. Uh, you know. Um, if I've got a question about anything, this is where I go first. And I would encourage everybody to consider uh, using them on a regular basis. If you don't have them, uh, you know, you can find most of this online. We have a uh, link to the OCA stuff on our Curling Eye Support webpage. And uh, the only one that isn't available online uh, is the Curling Ice Explain manual. So let's go to the next slide, Dan. Dan. I have gone to the next slide. Can you see that? Oh yeah, we're all set. Okay, so these are the items we're gonna cover. Um, you know, uh, pretty straightforward stuff. We'll talk about a couple examples of the challenges people face that uh, we've got some fixes for. We'll talk about assessing the ice runs and uh, a couple other things that are included. All right, let's go next. So just some definitions to give some thought to um, back one. So just to be clear that level refers to one thing, flat refers to a different type of ice. 
Sublimation is something that I think all of you find in your club on those uh, sheets next to the outside wall that where in point of fact, the air crossing the sheets basically just eats away the ice. And compaction is something again that it's found just about in every club and it's just the result of stones running up down that center line and results in usually a high center. All right, next slide. So here are a few of the causes of uh, your ice losing its shape. These aren't all of them. They're all ones that I think all of us are familiar with. Um, certainly uh, sublimation compaction are two of which are pretty much out of control. Pebbling is something that's somewhat in our control depending on whether you've only got two or three people pebbling your ice or whether you may be a club that's got many volunteers, maybe seven or eight different people that are pebbling your ice over the course of a week or two. So there are some things that make sort of maintaining flat and ice, flat and level ice a, a real challenge for some of the clubs. All right, next slide. Assessing the ice. So assessing the ice is really one of the critical aspects in being able to decide where you have a problem and what you can do about it and to what degree you have a problem. And so the two most obvious ones are to watch play or throw stones. And watching play works to a certain degree. The only problem with watching play is often when you watch play, stones aren't thrown everywhere on the ice. It's really dependent on what the game is and how the game is going. When you're throwing stones, you can throw stones everywhere on the ice. I happen to occasionally get forced to use a stick and learned how to use a stick and so for me, when I was doing ice, I found it a very helpful tool to use when I was throwing stones to kind of make a determination of assessing our ice. So there's some other specific ways that people have recommended. The first one is if you don't really, you're not familiar with what your sheet really looks like, um, playing stones down all the lines um, is a good methodology to follow. You can throw interns and outturns down each one of the lines and you'll get a sense of how much curl or not curl you don't have. Another method for determining whether your center is high or your outsides are high is to throw two stones down the center line, one an outturn, one an intern, then follow that with two more stones directed at the first stones, wherever the first stones land. And you throw those two second stones with the opposite turn and if those last two stones land on your line, whether it's a center line or an outside line, you'll know that your ice is flat and level. Now, once you've assessed your ice every day, however, whatever method you do use, you really want to make some notes about each sheet so that you can develop an ice plan for the day. I know one person that uses a whiteboard, a small whiteboard they can carry around in their hand. It's really helpful, a notepad, but it just helps to kind of concretely know What's your plan for the day if you've got to do anything special related to your ice being flat and level? I would also encourage people to uh, maintain an ice log. You know, ice logs are really helpful in terms of being able to go back and review what your ice looked like months earlier. You know, memory is one thing, but memories are weak. The other thing is it'll let you go back and ID any special circumstances. And the other thing where it might help is help you predict what's gonna be happening with your ice in the future. So as you go from a flood to your ice evolving into a certain shape over a period of four or five weeks, keeping a pretty accurate ice log is a really helpful tool to have. Okay, Dan, we can move on. All right, so in this presentation, I've created some illustrations. And basically, as I was reading through this material at the, in the OCA manual, I just was struggling in a way to sort of make it concrete in my mind. I'm kind of a visual person. And so I've created some illustrations that basically kind of show you the, you know, where the houses are and where the 12 foot is and the black line above that's the ice and the, pe the pebble is the blue dots. And so we're gonna go through a bunch of illustrations that kind of help understand sort of what's the problem and what are some of the solutions that are kind of recommended by the OCA. All right, let's go to the next slide. So this is pretty common for what everybody finds in their club. This would be kind of 
the result of sublimation, eating, eating away the sort of outside sheet of your ice, the one along the wall. And it's going to eat it away to a varying degree. If you're not touching it up on a regular basis, it's going to create a big low spot there where rocks will basically kind of stay straight or fall to the wall. So the first step is basically to assess the ice. The next step is going to be to feed the low spot with pebble. It might be one layer, it might be two layers, it might be three layers. Okay. Then you're going to finish with a full blending pebble on the whole sheet. And you're going to follow that with a normal scrape. Okay, next slide, Dan. So one of the things I'm doing here is I'm actually, uh, because you can't, it's a challenge to do PowerPoint on Zoom and have your presenter notes. Some of the things I'm using as notes are actually showing on the screen. So, so the first thing to talk about here is what are we trying to accomplish? And we have a couple things that we really are trying to accomplish. Some are immediate, some are midterm, and some are long-term. So the first thing we're trying to do is just raise the ice where it's low. So your first attempt is going to be just trying to get that done. You want to, on one day or two days, see that you're going to try an intervention that raises that ice on that side of the sheet so that when you throw stones down and again, they don't quite fall as much or they curl a little bit more. The next thing you're trying to accomplish is to get the ice to level. That might take you three or four days. It might take a week, okay? You shouldn't consider that you need to rush into that, okay? It's not anything, I mean, actually sort of working gradually to prove the situation over time is a good approach, actually. Um, once you get some learning under your belt and have a good sense of what you're doing, then you might be able to accelerate that. You know, the tolerance here is basically, you don't wanna make things worse. And then the third goal, which is the, really the ultimate place we want to be, is to then be able to maintain that ice at level every day or every week, all right? And so based on that, you're going to have to assess how quickly does sort of that sublimation occur on your outside sheets and what's the intervention? Is it touching them up every week? Is it touching them up every three or four days? But that's something that you'll kind of have to decide as you see how this uh as, you're, as you determine how your ice is being eaten away and how frequent. Next slide. So assessing the ice. So in this situation, and this will be true for almost all the situations, you're really trying to determine where the low spots are, okay? And how low is the ice in those places? You know, I found that, uh, does it run the length of the sheet? So in the club I was in a few years ago, we would find that the, the amount of sublation that occurred along the wall varied depending on what part of the sheet. In the corners, we found that there was more sublation than there was between, say, uh, the hog lines. And then how far out into the sheet does it go? Is it going out into just past the 12 foot, just a small amount? Are you seeing it all the way into the eight foot? So you really wanna have some sense of how far out into the sheet it goes. Then you're going to be thinking about how many layers of pebble are going to be needed to kind of address this. How many are you willing to put on in one, in one scrape, in one attempt? Okay, and again, you want to be cautious about what you do. You don't want to make anything worse than what it presently is. And then where does each layer begin and end both in length and width? Okay, so that you have a plan about how you're going to kind of side dress this sheet with pebble um, before you start. All right, next sheet, Dan. So then there's the question of how are you going to put down, what kind of pebble are you going to put down to raise that sheet? And so you could start with a coarse pebble, large pebble, right? With hot that just lays flat, which seems like it would be a pretty good idea. The caution with that is it's not very easy to cut down. So that type of pebble might be good to use your first layer, your second layer. When you get up near the top, you may actually want to use an extra fine with cold water, which will give you a pebble that'll stand up. It's a smaller pebble. It's definitely easier to cut down than a coarse pebble. Um, so, and then you also want to think about what's the pace that you're going to use, okay? To, how much pebble do you actually want to put down on that ice? You know, are you talking about a 50 second pass? Are you talking about a 50, 45 second pass? But you need to think about how much do I really want to put down? So, and those are things that you're gonna kind of sort through 
in some what would be described as trials. You know, you might try a course 73 and see how that works one day, evaluate how that works. The next day, think about is that the same thing you want to try again to build it up further and try something different. I think the closer you get to level, the more you want to move towards something like an extra fine with hot, with cold water. Now, the other thing you need to keep in mind is there's this critical juncture here where flat ice meets level that's not flat. And you want to be careful about how your pebble lays there, okay? Now, my experience has been trying to just get the pebble up to that point, all right? And then do a full blending pebble, all right? But we're going to talk in a minute about another example where um, people are using a different approach. All right, next slide. So finally, once you put on your full blended pebble across the whole sheet, then you're just going to follow with a normal scrape. Now, the reason I'm saying a normal scrape is because basically in some of these situations we're going to talk about, there's going to be some specific things that you would do with your scrape. But otherwise, just use what your normal daily scraping pattern would be. So, All right, next. All right, so now let's stop here for a second, Matt, and see if we've got any questions or people have any questions about what we just talked about because basically that's the foundation for what we're gonna to continue to talk about the rest of the time. There's nothing currently in the chat. We have one hand up, Kevin. Go ahead, Kevin. It's not, it's not me, yeah, Kevin. Kevin, no. Kevin, Kevin Polly. Kevin Polly. Okay. So you, what I'm looking at here is you're building up at least two layers on the outside of the sheet, and then you're doing your full pebble, or maybe more. So you're going to determine, you're going to, you're going to base how many layers you're going to put down based on how deep a hole you have, okay? All right. And so that's where I would say you want to start and go gradual. All right. So you don't want to put down too many. So at least when I first uh, tried this out, okay, a number of years ago, I went with uh, two layers and then I did a full layer across the sheet and then scraped. All right. And then, okay. went, back, then went back and threw stones. And it was pretty clear that that had made some difference, but not didn't get anywhere near raising it up to level. So as you first try this, you wanna start and possibly be conservative and just see what you put down and see what the effect is. Then you can start to make a determination about your next day scrape and pebble, what you wanna do there to further that process along, all right? But again, you don't necessarily need to rush it you want to do something in such a way that you're comfortable that you're making progress, that you're not necessarily doing anything to create some other problems on the ice. Because if you try and raise it too much at once, you could end up with a ridge there. And you don't want to do that. Okay? Okay. All right. So now, this is a similar example, same kind of thing. Low outside. Um, this is taken from the language of the uh, OCA. And you can basically see, see the process. It's basically the same. You're going to assess the ice. You're going to feed the low spot, finish with a full blend of pebble, and follow with a normal scrape. Let's go to the next slide. So now the thing about this was they put their first layer into the middle of the eight foot. Second layer went all the way to the center line, which is at the point of uh, that low spot starting. Their third layer they put to the edge of the eight foot on the high side. And so you've got an overlap when you put that finished pebble on. There's that 18 inches, two foot space in there um, in the center, okay, where you're going to have a pebble overlap. And I would just say that that would give me a little bit of concern, okay, just that are you going to end up putting a little ridge there? Are you doing something there that just might make it a little differently to scrape that down and flatten up? But otherwise, this is pretty much a standard approach. Uh, there's another slide we're going to see the same thing where they've got an overlap there that made me feel a little nervous and uncomfortable. And I've never tried this this way. Okay. I've, you know, used the other method be that I came up with, you know, and that it was advised to me by some ice techs in Ontario, but 
having seen this and laid it out on these illustrations, uh, that was one thing that kind of left me a little bit concerned. Next slide. All right, so now we're looking at what's called inverted dish. And this is really these low sides again, all right? Um, and in this instance, the scenario is the center is high. And so basically they're feeding pebble into the eight foot, okay? And then they're feeding pebble almost to the uh, center line into the four foot, okay? And then they've got this pebble going all the way into the center of the ice and it overlaps. And again, it's sort of this overlap I'm not sure is needed or required, but people might want to be cautious about that. So in this instance, we're going to scrape a little bit differently here. So basically, with the center line high, we're going to concentrate a little bit more on the center with some caution about uh, causing any runs in the forefoot. And also, you're going to use a scraping pattern that goes from inside to outside. Now, I think generally that's what most people use, so that shouldn't be too much too problematic, all right? And you might want to do a pass down the center line to take that down before you do any of your pebbling, okay? And then do all your feeding of the pebble into the sidelines, and then actually do a full sheet pebble before you start scraping. All right, David, what's your question? Matt, we got a question. Um. I get, a, I get a comment. The, I have four sheets of ice. It's a monolithic slab. I have no dividers. And what I'm seeing is I have more curl on one side of the sheet of the ice than the other. And this is prevalent with all four sheets. Um, I have tried your pebbling technique, and I do have sublimation on my south facing wall. It's starting to clear up now. I've been building that up, but don't you find with, you know, doing your heavy pebbling as you, you, you've you laid out from that edge and then building it, doesn't the consistency of the ice change considerably out there by doing that, depending on obviously what pebble head you do use? And then I go to a flat scrape. I mean, I peel my ice down every day and what I put down um, for my club curlers except on a Wednesday night where it's really competitive I'll use a 77 head 42 hole with 140 degree water I do a 35 second jog and I sweep my arm 90 times and then I nip and drag and I'll get I'll start with 3-8 three, nine splits. But my question has to do with the consistency of the ice and what the speed of the ice is going to, you know, what's going to happen when you go to build the ice like that on those areas where sublimation or low spots start to occur. I mean, it's not going to be consistent with the rest of the sheet. I wouldn't believe. Well, I think it depends, David, sort of how much you have to build them up. And certainly all these things the ideal scenario is intervene early. We'll talk about that in a, in a few, okay? I haven't noticed when we've had to do this or when I was doing this a few years ago that, that it created any challenges compared to the rest of the ice. I think the, full, the, the idea is that if it's got a full blended pebble across the whole top, all your play is on that, those top two layers of pebble, okay, that you're putting on last, okay? That's what the stones are running on. They're not running on anything underneath, okay? Now, I don't double pebble. Well, that's fine. So, but again, so to me, as you do these interventions, okay, you do have to be use some caution. Now, what I would say, David, is you might want to send us an email and we could have a conversation. We can uh, have Greg and myself and have a chat with you and get a better sense of what the specifics are about your situation um, and see what ideas we might have. Certainly, I would say Greg has... You know, Greg Eisenhower, certainly he's got more hands-on experience than I do. And yeah, no, I know Greg. And, yeah, uh, so, so I would just I'm just say, trying to uh, understand why I'm gonna, I get more curl on one side of my sheet than on the other. Well, and it, it may be just that that slide has sloped a little bit more center than the other, or the other side's a little lower than flat. And so but again, it doesn't fall. 
Well, I'm just saying that, you know, it's hard to kind of sense from here what that might be, but this could be a further conversation at, at some later date. Thank you. Okay. All right. So um, any other questions about this? All right, let's move on. Next slide, Dan. All right, so this is sort of very, very similar. Um, just thinking about an inverted dish, um, no center high. So this is very much like the first two examples we talked about. Pretty straightforward. Feed the outsides with pebble, full blending pebble on the whole sheet, follow with a normal scrape. And again, you really have to assess your eyes to make a determination of just how low are your outsides? What, how many layers might you need to start to address this situation? You really want to have a plan to put something happening over a number of days. Again, it's, you don't really need to rush it. You really want to work slowly to resolve the situation. All right, let's go to the next slide. So this is really the opposite of what we were just looking at. So it's not unusual to see sheets develop a high outside. Okay, that's basically the result of, it can be the result of normal pebbling. Okay, so when all of us are pebbling our sheets, we're looking to get a fur, like a one foot overlay, you know, outside the 12 foot. And for a lot of us, that's laying pebble on the next sheet, actually right in that 12 foot area. So it wouldn't be a surprise to see this happen in a number of clubs, right? So the intervention here would be to feed the center. You might wanna consider a pass or two down the sideline, similar to how you would hand, high, handle a high center line. Okay, although with some caution because you can have the same effect on the outside lines as you're gonna center line. If there's an opportunity if you uh, scrape too much out there, you're gonna put a run in the ice. Then you wanna, you know, pebble the center area, finish with a full sheet of pebble. And then you wanna use a scraping pattern that works from the outside to the inside. Start with the blade centered over the high side, high point, you know, at the edge of the 12 feet, foot and work from there towards the center. And again, you can be using, you know, whatever your normal scraping patterns are, you're just gonna work the patterns in a, a direction from the outside to the inside. Next slide. So this is where dish dice gets handled entirely different. So if you've got dividers between your sheets, or when you've got dish dice on, uh, next to the sideboards, we're gonna use a different approach to scraping. And so the problem here is the blade will start to ride high on the outside, can cause a run. Um, it just isn't gonna get you to a flatten level. So here you're gonna scrape from the center to the outside. If you, you know, moving over one foot for each pass, it's helpful if you remove a weight from the centerline side. If you have no weights in your blade, you can put a weight on the sideboard side and they'll help. And you also might wanna consider tightening up the ten temp tensioner just to lift the blade as you slide it, all right? So basically you're gonna feed pebble to the center, have a, a, a finished pebble on it, and then on the sheet on the side along the sideboards, okay? You're gonna use the scraping from outside from inside to outside. Now, I've never done this. I could see this as being a little risky, okay? And I just think it's something that you really wanna to try to prevent having, okay? High outsides, but this is sort of what is recommended as an approach to help solve this problem. And as I said, it strikes me is just to be used with caution. Next slide. So as you can see from the previous slide, high outsides and high centers are really a problem. So early intervention is really what you want to try to do. And that, you know, if you're not going to be able to keep from high centers rising or the high outsides rising, there's a point of no return where basically you're looking at flooding or doing a controlled melt as a way to fix it. 
And again, it helps to have an ice log so that you can start to keep track of what's going on with your eyes, be able to predict at what point in time you can see your center's probably going to be starting to rise or at what point you're going to see the outsides of your eyes start to rise. If you don't have a log, you know, assess your eyes as frequently as you can so that you can identify when you want to start thinking about intervening. You know, starting early is a little better than starting late. Next slide. All right, maybe we'll stop here for a second. So any questions at this point? Uh, Russell, we have uh, one comment from Tim from Halifax. For the person who had more curl on one side of every sheet, have you had someone watch your pebble spread? Usually more curl on one side is an indication of pebble coverage. Okay, thanks for sharing. All right, let's move on. So now going. This is what we kind of type of ice we have in the club where I usually would be curling. Um, and so again, it's sort of assess the ice. And you're really kind of assessing three areas of the ice. You're assessing both of the outside parts of the ice and then the area in the center where it's low. And so you want to have a sense of how low it is in each of those places. You're going to come up with a plan about how you're going to feed those areas with some pebble. Again, trying to think about how many layers you're going to need to um, start to address that situation. You know, it's not something you need to address in one day or you can think about addressing in one day, but trying to think about what your plan is. You're going to finish with a full blended pebble and then you're going to scrape. So you're going to have a follow a normal scrape but working from the outside towards the center. And then you want to consider an extra pass or two at the middle of the eight foot to help bring down that gullwing piece of business. Now, one of the uh, suggestions were this, that um, if you use a down, dome pebble head, that that might lead to uh, gullwing happening is that it seems to lay more pebble in the eight foot area, whereas kind of uh, in the outer area of the eight foot compared to a beaver tail. So, you know, they're both different uh, pebble heads. They're like having different tools, okay? It's really probably important to have both of them in your kit. And you can use one or the other or address both of them. The club I'm in, we have going problems and we don't use a, a dome pebble head. So I don't think necessarily that's always the cause. Um, and this is sort of the ice that's named after Shorty Jenkins and um, as being don't confuse it with center high, it's not center high. All right, next. Center high. So prevention, early intervention is the best approach. Working to the, working the centers too much causes a run in the output area. Follow rule two. So World Curing Federation, their recommendation is rule two is for when you're important things to know when you're uh, maintaining your ice bed is always finish with a pen, pass down the center. Next slide. So this also came from the World Curling Federation. So if you want to try something in terms of scraping, their suggestion was a four hole over the center line followed by a one hole on the tram line, which I interpret to be the four foot line. I can't tell you that exactly, but I think that's what they're referring to and then finish with a four pass in the opposite direction. Okay. And I think their thinking was that that first pass has the blade over both the center line and the four foot area. And then uh, the one hole on the tram line will help take down the eight foot area. So that's what they're suggesting and it's something you might wanna try. Next slide. All right, the other problem people are The other thing that other thing we're challenged with is runs. And scraping really can prevent runs. It's really not a great tool for fixing runs. You know, um, Jamie Barrasso suggests pebbling before you for scraping can help fill runs, which I think is probably some truth to that. You know, causes or runs are frequent use of, without scraping. So if you've got a lot of play going on and you're not uh, scraping every day, um, just 
random play plus pebbling, you could really start to end up with some runs. Scraping with a blade is not true. So if you're finding yourself getting runs on a regular basis, you might want to check your blade. And then scraping on ice that's not flat and level. And that we had just talked about a couple scenarios where that was the case. Next slide. All right. So another way of thinking about some of the things we've just seen is if you've got a run in the forefoot, that might be caused by trying to lower high centers. Or it might be caused by trying to lower high outsides along the sideboards. Runs in the eight foot area might be caused by just trying to lower high outsides. So you wanna think about where you're getting runs, all right? And then start to think about how those runs might be occurring, okay? Is your blade being tilted? I mean, that's what's happening when you're trying to get down high outsides. The same thing starts to happen when you're doing center line. So you just need to give some thought about where are you finding these runs? You know, if you're finding a run on one side of the sheet and not on the other, then that's something I wouldn't know what to think about, to be honest, okay? So, but in general, it seems like my experience with runs has been, you know, they tend to find appear on both sides of the sheets, at least a couple of places that I've played. All right, any questions about where we are now? Yes, Russell, there's one from Mikhail Kurbatov. He's asking, to determine that you have a level problem, what do you use? Observations, player comments, or is there a tool for it, like a laser or anything else? So I would just say this. Um, I don't think you really, I'm not sure how accurate a laser would be, having spent some time uh, training to be a surveyor, I can tell you that uh, it's really hard to get down to knowing using that kind of tool to find, finally decide, you know, whether your ice is flat and level. So what most people recommend is throwing stones, watching stones, that those are the, watching stones should give it away sooner than just about anything else that you could do. Now, so, and throwing stones on your ice. Now, relying on players in your club, I would say it really depends on who you're relying on. So in one of the clubs I was in, there was a, a junior that I relied on, okay, who he curled in our most competitive league. And what I knew about him was he would honestly tell you what the ice was doing. It wasn't a factor of what happened in the last end of the last game. It wasn't, you know, whether he was winning games or losing games. He could just give you a very good sense of how the ice was playing. And so if you've got one or two people in your club, they might not even be your best players, okay? All right. But if people who are good at reading the ice, sensitive to what the ice is doing, and are going to give you an honest, you know, independent, opinion, okay, that, that you're not going to be hearing from them based on what the last game was or what the last shot was, then those are people you should be able to rely on. But I think it's just trying to find the people, okay, who can give you that advice. So, and it doesn't hurt to have a second opinion. I mean, I really appreciated what um, this person could share with me, and I'd see him every two or three weeks and ask just, what do you think about the ice? And, you know, I could always count on him to give me an honest opinion, and it usually concurred what I was thinking about what was going on. All right, Matt, anything else? Yes, uh, Bob from Peachtree is asking, how do you address unlevel ice that is only occurring at one end of the sheet? So at one end of the sheet, and are we talking about it only being on one sheet or are we talking about it being across the end? Yeah, just say one sheet, one sheet. So and is it, and, and which sheet is it? Is it along a wall? Is it in the center of the ice? Uh, center of the ice. Hmm. And so you're finding that just, you've got one sheet in the center of a four sheet club? Three sheet club. Three sheet club, so it's your center sheet, and one side of that is always lower than the other? Appears to be that way. And so, 
and you're using the same scraping, same pebbling on that sheet consistently, just like the other sheets. Correct. We can build it up in between draws, but as we keep scraping, we take it back down. But you're not taking down the other side of the sheet. Correct. So, you know what? I would say this would be a further conversation, probably one to have with okay. Greg, all right? It just seems odd to me. Usually if you're following the same, pa same patterns on both sides of the sheet, really, you shouldn't have that happening. Now, so then do you have a sand floor or concrete floor? Yeah, that's what we think it is. We have a sand base. So then the question would be, so before you put in your ice every year, you know, do you look at that? Have you kind of, that might be something to look at to see whether in point of fact, there's that section of your base, okay, is a little bit sunk. So between sheet two and three, let's say if it's that side of sheet two, then you'd also maybe see that the kind of the inside side of sheet three might be down a little bit too. So in other words, it's almost like you, you know, you're, you, you're flooding on top of something that's not level, so you're not gonna end up at level. But that would be, you know, you should check that next fall if you've already got your ice in, but to see just how level is your base at that point in time. And then the question also might be, is your base moving? Okay, now it seems a little odd. I would have thought something would have rose versus, you know, if you've got a sand base and you get a little bit of a frosty in there, it's gonna go up versus going down, right? So this seems a bit odd to me, you know, and I think Greg has a little bit more experience about this than I do. So he might be the person to chat with about this, Bob. Okay, thanks. Okay. All right, next slide. All right, scraping. So basically, it seems to me that based on all that I saw in the OCA manual was that inside outside patterns help with high centers and high outside along the sideboards. Outside inside patterns help with high outsides along the sideboard, except along the sideboards and with gullwing ice. So these are things that you can kind of put in your toolkit to think about as you start addressing problems. And you might have problems that, you know, come up that we haven't even talked about here. So different shaped ice that we didn't talk about. Okay, you could have, you know, what might be considered a fall from one side to the other side. One side is high and the other side's low and it's not, there's no flat part on the ice. So that some of these things might help you decide how you want to approach your scraping patterns, okay, when you're doing your eyes. All right, let's go to the next slide. All right, so basically, you know, prevention, early intervention with possibles is the best strategy. And it's really understanding when your eyes starts to move from being flat and level to slightly not flat and level. And you'll know where that's happening, you know historically how that, when that's happening. And that's when you can try to intervene before it starts to occur, especially true center ice high, all right? That once that starts to grow, you're gonna have trouble getting that down without causing some other problem on your ice. The same with high outsides. And we're all been faced with these challenges. I mean, it is really hard, you know, especially if you're only in there once a week, or you've got two or three people doing your ice during the week. Um, whereas if you're in your, in your ice shed five days a week, um, you should have a pretty good handle on how your ice is changing over, over the period of time from when you flood to when your ice starts to get out of shape. You know, helps to assess the situation, develop a plan, okay? It always helps to have a plan. And if you're just gonna kind of go off, you know, and do something off the top of your head, you're probably not going to get a good outcome. And the tolerance is always to not make things worse. You know, use resources that are available to you. If you know other people that you feel are confident ice guys that you can talk with, you definitely should be talking with them. You know, for people in the GNCC and anybody else that wants to get some help, you can email us at ice at gncc.org and we'll see what we can do to help sort through, talk through things with you before you start to do an intervention. You know, working gradually to improve your situation over time is a pretty good strategy. Trying to quickly fix something usually isn't. And it's especially if you're trying something new that you haven't tried before, 
you know, don't be kind of trying to fix things quickly. It's okay to work at it. Um, you know, it's a better approach and keep track of what you're doing and keep notes so that you know what you did. You know, like I said, all of us are busy. We all think we have great memories, but in point of fact, it's really easy to forget things. And the last thing I would say is be willing to experiment. And when I talk about experimenting, I'm just talking about be willing to try different things. And the key to doing experiments, uh, or my background is in healthcare and quality improvement, was, you know, we use trials for things. We try things once to see if it works, see if it was an improvement, see if it got the result we were looking for. And the key to that is only changing one variable at a time. Okay, so I would encourage people to be willing to experiment. Okay, you want to be cautious when you do it, all right, and thoughtful when you do it. And you're only going to know if it took had its real effect is if you're only changing one variable at a time. So, you know, it's one of the ways that you're going to learn the most. It's just about observing and learning as you acquire more experience and spend some time at this, it really becomes more natural. But I have to say that it, it is part of the challenge I know in the GNCC, and I've had that same experience in clubs is, you know, when you've got three or four different people doing your ice, and you've got eight or 10 people, different people doing your pebbling, okay, it's really hard to kind of prevent things from happening. And so it's important to have some tools in your toolkit that will help you address those things when they occur. All right, so. Last thing I'll say about this is that uh, Pete Delapel and I are working to put together a, a written document with all of everything we've talked about here and based on some other questions so that people will be able to download that at some point in time off our Curling Ice support page and keep it at your club and be able to use it as kind of a reference tool. All this information is available online, like I said, that you can read what it says in the uh, Ontario Curling Association's ICE manual, and that will tell you sort of what, how they wrote this up. It's a little bit challenging in some ways, but uh, the information's there. And again, World Curling Federation, Scottish Curling Ice Group, they have some great information regarding scraping patterns, corrective patterns that you can use. So, any questions? All right, if we don't have any questions, if there's no further questions, then I would just say this. Thank you all for joining us tonight. I hope this was helpful. I hope it's useful information that at some point in time, you'll be able to apply to improve your ice in your club. If anybody wants to get in touch with us for some follow-up information, David, Bob, anybody else, you can reach us at uh, ice at gncc.org. So thanks again. Please fill out the evaluation form that you get from Pete De La Pella. It should come with an email in uh, not uh, email in the subject uh, heading that says uh, maintaining flat and curling up, flat and level ice. All right. Well, thanks, Russell. We appreciate all your time and advice today. Uh, as Russell mentioned, um, you will be getting that evaluation form. We appreciate you filling that out and getting back to us. Uh, as you all know, uh, this program being sponsored by the GNCC. Uh, is done at no cost to any of you. So um, to those of you who serve on the GNCC board, we thank you for your time and efforts. Uh, actually, it looks like we have a hand up, Russell. Uh, Wayne Anderson from Bucks. Go ahead, Wayne. Wayne. Maybe it was an inadvertent hand up. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. All right. All right. Uh, but thank you um, to the GNCC. We, you know, we appreciate that. And, and again, thank you all for your participation. And, and, and Dan, thank you for allowing us to use your Zoom. We appreciate that. Thanks a lot, Dan. Anytime. <laughs>